everybody that's listening. Um, thank you so much for joining us for the topic today. And the topic is how and when to open and setting expectations. Today's Zoom is also today's Business and Leaders Luncheon. And I know it's not lunchtime, but it is the Business and Leaders event. So as we continue in the chamber to adjust how we can provide information to each other, we're also adjusting how we can provide a value to our sponsors. So with that being said, I wanna give a shout out to our Business and Leaders sponsors. They are the Boeing Company, PGE, Columbia Bank, Gresham Barlow School District, and Metro East Community Media. So I wanna thank them for making all of our events possible, but this one in particular. Many of you and many that haven't been able to join us today have submitted questions ahead of time. And I accumulated all those questions and forwarded them to our four speakers and they will be doing their best to answer your questions that were uh, submitted prior. But if you have a, a question during the speeches today, during the talks today, feel free to write them down in the chat. We're not gonna be able to take time to have them be answered today, but I will make sure that they get forwarded to the appropriate person for an answer. We do have four speakers today, Multnomah County Chair Deborah Kapori, State Representative Christine Drazen, our Gresham Mayor Shane Bemis, and Dr. Jennifer Vines. I will introduce each one of them prior to them speaking so that you can get to know them a little better. So we're gonna go ahead and jump right in. And I'm gonna introduce our first speaker, which is Chair Deborah Kapori. Chair Kapori um, has, is with us and I've had the pleasure of serving with her in the Capitol as she started her public service career in the Oregon House of Representatives. While she was there, she served two years as the minority leader. In 2008, she was elected to the Multnomah County Commission and then elected to our county chair position in 2014 and reelected four years later for her second term. As a commissioner, she worked on efforts to replace the Selwood Bridge and the Multnomah County Courthouse. Good job on that, appreciate that. In response to the housing crisis, Deborah Kafori established a joint office of homeless services in partnership with the city of Portland. The joint office consolidated a number of initiate, initiatives under one roof. Chair Kafori has made strong efforts to include our area, the East Out, East County area in many of her decisions. And as a result, and through those actions that she has shown, our business community is looking forward to her continued support of them through this pandemic. Her actions have shown that not just downtown Portland businesses are important to Multnomah County, but all businesses are, including the Gresham businesses, because we all bring value when it comes to the economic health of our entire region and our community. Chair Kapori, I want to thank you for that, for those efforts, and um, look forward to the continuation of that. That being said, Chair Kapori, the table is yours. Thank you. Um, took me a minute to get off mute. I, I don't think I'm getting any better at the Zoom calls, although I, I should at this point be an expert. So thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Multnomah County Chair Deborah Kafori, and I want to start by thanking you for inviting me and um, some of the members of my team to your meeting today. About eight weeks ago, the governor of Oregon issued a historic stay home order designed to slow the spread of COVID-19. Most of us haven't experienced a disruption to daily life like this in our lifetimes. And from the very beginning of this emergency, my priority has been the safety and health of our community as we navigate these unprecedented times together. I know that this emergency has taken a toll on everyone over the last several months. It has been an unprecedented challenge for our community. It's been devastating for people who have lost their jobs, people who worry about how they'll keep their housing and how, how they will pay their bills. My sympathies are with the 57 families who've lost a loved one to this virus and the more than 1,000 people who have become ill, people who range in age from 14 years old to those in their 90s. I frankly worry about everyone in my life, including everybody on this call. What gives me hope is seeing all the ways in which people and organizations have stepped up for each other. I wanna thank everyone who stayed home so our community could keep the virus from spreading and everyone who kept going to work to keep the rest of us going. The data is clear that social distancing has made a difference. 
the spread of the virus has slowed and our hospital system has not been overwhelmed. And this would not have happened without everyone's cooperation and everyone's sacrifice. We literally have saved lives by staying home. Starting last Friday, the governor loosened restrictions on retail, some childcare and summer camps, most of which can now open if they adhere to state issued guidelines. Moving beyond this limited reopening and to be ready for phase one of the governor's reopening framework, we must meet conditions set by the state and additional conditions specific to Multnomah County. These thresholds will help ensure that we mitigate against disproportionate impacts to our elders, to the people working in public facing jobs like grocery stores, food processing, and healthcare, and those who have a higher risk of, of serious illness because of historic health inequities in the Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and other people of color. I want the public to see what I see and know what I know. So every week, we publish a dashboard. It's on our website at moltco.us backslash COVID-19. And it shows how close we are to meeting state and county criteria for reopening. Today, I'm happy to report that we have met several new benchmarks, including personal protective equipment for first responders, 14 days of declining hospitalization overall, and declining cases for our black, indigenous, and communities of color. We are making progress towards meeting the remaining benchmarks. For example, we are now able to reach 75% of cases within 24 hours. The criteria that we're aiming for is 95%. And we continue to scale up our contact tracing staff. The key point here is that our public health scientists are using data to inform our decisions. And the fact is that Multnomah County is not like the rest of the state. We are the most urban, densely populated county in Oregon. We have 20% of the state's population, but we have suffered through 27% of COVID cases and 40% of the deaths. We have the largest hospital systems that the entire state and region depend on. I know that everyone is anxious to reopen businesses and resume activities. I am. It, um, get so many questions all day long, phone, email, text, people ask me, when are we going to get back to normal? And it doesn't stop when I get home. My kids are clamoring to know when they can get back to normal. But the reality is until we have a widely available vaccine for COVID-19, we're not going to get back to normal. We've learned that COVID spreads even more easily than we thought, and it can strike people of all ages. We have not beaten COVID-19, but what we have done is to buy ourselves time to prepare. We know that the virus will spread as we come back together, but we can take simple steps to protect our families. We will need to stay vigilant. That means continuing physical distancing to the extent possible, wearing face coverings, and frequently washing our hands with warm soap and water. We are all going to have to adapt our daily lives, expectations, habits and routines for the foreseeable future. And we must stay alert to where the disease is moving in the community and be ready to adjust. I also need to note that the only way that we can reopen in a way that safely and equitably moves every corner of our community forward together is with significant financial help. You've heard about the $1.7 billion that's been allocated, allocated to regional governments in Oregon, the state, through the Federal CARES Act package. Well, we've received less than 2% of the total CARES Act funding. As the public health authority leading our region through the pandemic and the largest safety net in the state, this is nowhere near enough. The blunt calculation used to allocate these funds has hurt the people of Multnomah County and risks undercutting our ability to reopen and recover safely. Be assured, I am working diligently with elected leaders at every level of government to ensure that we have the resources we need to respond. But I need your help. We need to make sure that this message is being echoed by all the leaders in our community, like all of you on this call today. One of the other questions that was presented to me before this event was about our coordination with the other counties. I wanna assure you that the chairs of Washington, Clackamas and Multnomah County are meeting at least three times a week. And we've also included the other counties that are in our health region. 
Since the start, we've been committed to moving together as a region. But I want to yet realize that we may not, that does not mean that we will all reopen on the same day. But what we all share in common is that we are putting the well being of our communities first. And what gives me hope as we move forward is the strength of the organization and the dedication of the people in our organization. And with that, I will turn it over to Multnomah County. Oh, actually, I think, uh, sorry, Lynn, you are gonna have the floor and tell us who is the next speaker. Muted. There, thank you. Um, thank you for answering those questions and putting it, I'm, I'm sure that a lot of the folks that are listening um, want to have a date and you very clearly put out the fact that there's sort of so many uh, things that need to happen in order for a date to happen but in your head do you have a date that you would like to shoot for um, to get those funds I mean a goal of some sort I'm not holding you to that date but is it is it July 4th is it Thanksgiving is it tomorrow is can you give us kind of an idea Holly, I think she's muted still. There. I've been saying, I think it gives people a lot of power when they can control elected officials and politicians mute button. Don't we all wish at times we could just <laughs> sit in our living room and push mute? <laughs> no. I give her those directions. <laughs> um, I don't exactly have a date per se in my head. I know that for me, learning that um, that the other counties in our in our region are looking uh, for the beginning of June. That's kind of set that as as one benchmark. And I'll also say that because again because we are such a different uh, county, we have so many businesses. So we viewed Friday's opening of all retail um, and daycare as kind of a, in a way for us it is a phase one. So we're going to be looking to see how that impacts, you know, the, the rate of um, disease and whether we're still able to hold ourselves to this high standard that we have is trying to get 95% of, of cases contacted within a 24 hour period. We, we haven't met that yet, but we are ramping up our contact tracers so that we can meet that goal. And so I think you will see, we'll have a much, every week that goes by, have a much clearer outlook of where we're going. But I think that having last Friday as kind of a test case will really give us an indication as we look at the numbers as to what, whether we're ready to go in a three week period or whether, you know, things just blow up. I believe that the worst thing that we could do is open up to, well, actually there's many worse things. One of the worst things that we could do is to open up too quickly and then have to clamp down again. It's, I just, I, I feel for, all the folks who've lost their jobs and whose businesses are on the edge. And I think if we open up and then have to close down again, it not only erodes people's confidence and their spirits, but it's, it's gonna be just an even worse hit for our economy. Okay, thank you for that. Um, oftentimes, especially business owners, they work on deadlines so right. that they can help ramp things up. And that was why I asked that question, but you asked for help. Um, in terms of the, the money and, and putting pressure in those kinds of things. So if, if there was a deadline or, or some sort of a goal, I think we could rally some of that support around that if we had an idea. So if you want to contact me at a later date to see how I can help coordinate that, because I know I know I have a lot of businesses that would like to sit down and talk to you about their, their personal stories and and how, and you've heard them all, but um, but how, but if they can be of help, so that our business doesn't travel out of Multnomah County and go to Clackamas County because they are open. Mm -hmm. I would be happy to help facilitate that because they do, they have a strong desire to be at the table with you to help get that done, whatever it is. And I do believe that there is a lot of work that can be done now in preparation for a phase one opening. I mean, there are going to be the restrictions that have been outlined as to um, the social physical distancing that's going to be need, needed to take place in an establishment and the um, the hygiene, the protection, all of the, the personal protective equipment that people are going to need, face coverings, potentially mat, I mean, potentially gloves, 
hand sanitizer. So I think um, I would encourage everyone to, to be prepared because one thing that I saw with last Friday's reopening is that um, there were a lot of businesses, there's still businesses that, that could, can open, but they're not ready yet. So I think as we, as we um, give ourselves this buffer here, where we're watching the numbers or watching the data, we can still be prepared so that when the time comes, we'll ready, the people are ready to go. Okay, thank you for that. So those are encouraging words, we appreciate it. And I know we should run a little bit over, I know Chair Kapori, that you have another engagement after this. So I'm trying to keep everything on time, but I'm thank saying you. that ahead of time. And I think also on, um, on our call today is our commissioner that represents our district, which is Commissioner Lori Stegman. So having said that, thank you very much, Commissioner, for joining us. And Deborah Kapori, thank you too, as well. Okay, so our next speaker is um, someone that I have never met before until today, and I'm so glad that you were able to join us, Dr. Vines. Dr. Jennifer Vines is the region's lead health officer and serves as the medical director of the Communicable Disease Services, including programs to prevent, track, and treat tuberculosis and sexually transmitted infections. Dr. Vines is a member of the public health leadership team responsible for advancing public health policy, serves as chair of the Public Health Ethics Committee, and is a statewide health officer representative on the state on the Oregon's Public Health Advisory Board. Prior to joining the, the health office pro, officer program, Dr. Vines served as the health officer for Columbia County in Oregon and is the deputy health officer, was the deputy health officer for several counties in Southwest Washington. She trained at OHSU, I don't think they have a football team, but go OHSU, in the family practice and preventative medicine. Dr. Vines has a master's degree in public health and health management and policy. I'm really pleased that you were able to join us today and I'm hoping that you get to address some of the questions we have around the contact tracing and those were some of the biggest questions that came to us earlier. So Dr. Vines, welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you for such a warm welcome and for the invitation to join you all this afternoon. Um, it's really my pleasure to be here. Uh, again, I'm Jennifer Vines. I am a physician and the Multnomah County Health Officer. Um, I think our chair covered um, the key points uh, very well. Again, our county is at 1,000 cases so far, 57 deaths. Um, that's an order of magnitude higher than Clackamas County, which um, as of today sits at 284 cases and nine deaths. Um, and it's still quite a bit higher than Washington County, uh, which has 650 cases approximately and 17 deaths. So again, density matters. Um, and as a, a relatively small geographic county, but a largely populated county, um, we do want to be cautious in our approach to reopening. And as our chair said, make sure we get it right um, rather than uh, potentially having to go, go back and forth between an, an open and closed scenario. So um, I uh, am happy to talk about the role of contact tracing. There's a lot of interest uh, in this function of public health. And I'll start by saying that this is something that we do day to day on, in, in normal times. Um, uh, certain infections are uh, reportable to the local public health authority, which sits in Multnomah County and in our health department. Um, and that can be anything that's potentially contagious from uh, salmonella to tuberculosis uh, to many other infections. And so we have a team of disease investigators who uh, are a combination of nurses, uh, epidemiologists, uh, which is, um, means uh, ex experts in disease uh, tracking and patterns. Uh, we have community outreach workers. Uh, we have a whole team of people um, that follows up on these reports, partly to find out where the person um, may have gotten infected and then also to notify others that they may have exposed. And so um, this is a, a county role and it's, it's the local public health role. So what it means for COVID-19 is that as we think about loosening restrictions um, and opening things up, in addition to individual responsibility of you know, staying home when you're sick, uh, wearing a face covering, keeping your hands clean, uh, maintaining that six foot distance. In addition to that individual responsibility, um, there's a level of employer responsibility about creating uh, safe spaces for people uh, to interact, um, to, get, to get their needs met, whether that's uh, food or things they need, they need to buy or other services they need. So th those are components um, of a safe reopening. And then ultimately contact tracing um, is kind of the, the, it's kind of the ultimate safety net. So as people start to move more, interact more, go to more places, uh, the virus will almost certainly spread. Um, we know that it spreads easily from person to person. 
And probably one of the most challenging things about this virus is that people without symptoms um, can transmit uh, to others. So it becomes uh, difficult just to be looking for someone with a cough illness. Um, that's, that's simply not enough to identify uh, who's most likely to, to have the virus. So contact tracing um, is built on a foundation of easy access to testing. Um, so that is one of our reopening criteria. And we are uh, in particular committed to making sure that East County has accessible sites uh, for easy COVID-19 testing. And then those positive test reports get, uh, get re reported to Multnomah County, to our investigations team. Um, and then that team has to notify the person who is positive, make sure they understand their test results, um, do some basic health education with them, and make sure they understand how long they need to stay away from others until they're no longer infectious. They also have to quickly build trust and a rapport with that person because the next set of questions is where that person spent time during the period that they uh, could have potentially transmitted the virus. And not only where were they, but who were they with? And we're and we'll be asking for those names and contact information because the next step is to, is to notify those people who were potentially exposed and let them know how to stay safe, which right now is a 14 day, uh, what we call home quarantine, which is really um, an isolation period of two weeks at home on symptom watch. So um, there's a real art uh, to this public health work um, in terms of having a combination of medical background um, and ease in uh, making essentially cold calls uh, to people uh, to, again, establish that trust and rapport, and then ultimately to support people to do what we're asking them to do, which is essentially to stay, to stay home and to stay away from others. So in that sense, we need the, the community supports for people who, who may say, you know, I don't want to infect my coworkers, but I have to pay my rent. I have to put food on my table. So having the resources to actually come in and, and offer um, to help people do the right thing. So uh, on a, again, in, in normal times, we have a team of about seven. Um, we are looking to scale that up by two orders of magnitude to around 100. So that is a huge lift. Um, and again, it can't be just anybody. So we're looking for certain positions with uh, medical public health uh, expertise. Uh, we are looking for people who have good people skills in terms of making phone calls. And probably most importantly, we're looking for um, community health workers and other contact tracers who look like our county, which means they speak the languages, um, they have uh, cultural ties, um, and they are trusted, uh, trusted people within the communities that we're going to be trying to reach um, who may otherwise have difficulty uh, accessing health services um, by virtue of um, language or immigration status, um, or even just, just culturally how they think about health. Um, so again, that's the part that we really want to get right because that now becomes the, the I want to say the sort of the, the plan B. So social distancing worked really well. And in order to reopen and start mixing, we have to have uh, a really good public health system set up uh, essentially to find pockets of disease and contain it um, and ask just certain people to stay home rather than asking everybody to stay home. So that's the logic, that's the lift um, that we are making uh, here uh, at Multnomah County, both around the testing and around getting the right people into the contact tracing positions. Um, I would say what you all can do to help is that if you are in touch with community organizations, um, please send them to our website. Um, if they're not already engaged with us, we'd love to hear from them. And similarly, if you know of individuals who have uh, particular skills or who are interested, you can send them to health.recruiting at multco.us. Um, I think those were all of my prepared remarks. Um, I think I'll uh, close out there and uh, be happy to stay on until four o'clock and help answer questions. So um, Dr. Bynes, before you, before you get muted, mm -hmm. um, I do have a question. How are you going about trying to find those folks? You, you probably can't use Indeed and you know, in, you know, those kinds of avenues. But I, I had someone contact my office that has a company that does those kinds of things and said, I forwarded it, but I haven't heard back. So I'm wondering what the, what, what the criteria is, how you're going about advertising so that we could maybe speed up the process. I know what it's like to hire somebody, it takes forever. And you've got a huge job to hire that many people, but what can we do or how do they get around? Um, how are you trying to find those folks? And I'm just curious, do you do the hiring? Is there, is there somebody else that does it? What Internally, what happens? 
So, so great question. A lot of people are finding us. So I and everyone at the health department is getting emails every day from generous uh, people and also um, businesses and organizations offering to pitch in this effort. Um, so thank you for that. I would say um, we uh, will be hiring some of these as internal county positions. Uh, so we'll be posting them, which is why the email address I gave you um, is really just a chance to submit interest and to learn how to sign up for job alerts as they get posted on the Multnomah County website. Um, we're also going to be looking to community-based organizations, again, where we think that uh, trusted leaders and culturally specific individuals, uh, people with the language skills, people with knowledge of uh, health beliefs of certain, um, certain specific communities uh, where they are, um, uh, to engage them either in a sort of community health worker component um, or in that um, support piece that I talked about around actually supporting people's um, immediate material needs while, while we ask them to isolate or quarantine. Okay. I'm going to ask you a similar question that I asked Sherka for. Do you have a date in mind of when you want to accomplish a hiring all these folks and then work backwards from that date to make sure that they, they get hired? And my second question would be, are you advertising or would you be willing to take folks from outside of our state and bring them in if they have the expertise and the availability? I think my understanding at this point is that, um, to your last question, is that our recruiting efforts will be, they'll be posted, so they'll be like, like any other job um, uh, at, at Multnomah County. Uh, okay. We are going to look at how many uh, internal Multnomah County employees can be redirected to these jobs, um, depending on their skill set, uh, and then posting others. Um, I would say, let's see, your first question was around the date, the date, the date. So we do um, have a signal from the governor that we don't have to necessarily have, you know, a hundred people at a desk with a computer and a phone ready to go in order to reopen. Um, but okay. we do need to have a plan. And I think internally no, knowing that this is now the strategy that's, uh, that, that's going to protect the community. I think we are figuring out what level, what minimum level would we need to reach to feel comfortable opening? Uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that full 122 uh, that the state has calculated based on our population. That's encouraging. And I would guess that you have a comfort level number that you have in your head of what you would feel good about as you manage that, that operation. So it is comforting that the governor potentially would work with you on, on that number. Because it's daunting to raise to hire one or two people, let alone a hundred, under the kind of conditions that we're in with language, compassion, expertise, all of those kinds of things. So thank you for that. And thank you for your hard work. Appreciate that very much. All right. Next, um, as a speaker, we have Representative Christine Drazen. Representative Drazen is a fourth generation Oregonian. She's serving her first term in the Oregon legislature. And in September of 2019, the House Republicans selected her, even as a first termer, to be their minority leader. Representative Drazen's committee assignments during the session included health care, economic development, Ways and Means Subcommittee on Education, and the Emergency Board. And all of those have been very important, especially right now. They've all kind of come together. Representative Drazen currently serves as a legislative representative to the Oregon Innovation Council. Graduate of George Fox, she served on the Clackamas County Planning Commission and was the executive director of a cultural advocacy coalition, which is a statewide nonprofit that supports the pres uh, preservation of Oregon's history and culture. So Representative Drazen, she has um, kind of the full meal deal she has from the nonprofit world to the business world, economic development, health care, ways and means, education, lives in a rural community. She has uh, she served in the legislature as on staff um, a couple of decades ago, and now she's gone full circle as an elected official. So we appreciate the time that you've taken to be with us today. Although Gresham isn't in your district, I think you could represent the, the environment that's happening in Salem and tell us what is going on and what we can do to help. So Representative Drazen, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Lynn. It's always so great to see you and it's great to be back uh, with the Gresham Chamber again. It's been a while. Uh, last time I was with you, I was doing a legislative wrap up with Senator Modest Anderson. Um, oh, so right. it's great to be back again. 
Yeah, and so um, I have the um, I have the privilege of representing the House Republican Caucus in the mid in the midst of a very um, tumultuous time, and I would say in this moment that we have extra, extra, extraordinary pressure on uh, our system of government to operate in a way that provides crisis level leadership in a way that continues to be accountable and transparent and bipartisan. And I am committed to uh, furthering that goal in everything that I do as I work through this issue uh, alongside my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. And so as we have uh, worked at the state level and looked at these issues at a state level, today was our revenue forecast uh, where our state economists came uh, before our revenue committee and let us know exactly how deep the hole will be at a state level. And I mentioned uh, because uh, work and participation with counties uh, really depends on our ability to protect our safety net. And there's more pressure on our counties. There's more pressure on our counties. There's more pressure on our cities as we uh, continue to move through this process if the state is not able to maintain its safety net. I, and so, wait, I feel like I am fading in and out on you guys. Am I fading in and out on you, Lynn? A little bit, yeah. Oh. Um, can I do something really tacky and take off my video and just talk so you can hear me? Yes, that would be fine. Whatever you feel comfortable <laughs> with, it works for you. That's great. I'm, I'm going to be a voice for a minute in hopes that you can hear me. Maybe that'll help. Okay. Okay, so um, I, what I was saying was, was that the state economist let us know today that the state uh, budget, as you can imagine, faces substantial downward pressure right now to cut costs and to um, control uh, to control spending. And the state's responsibility in this moment, from my perspective, is to limit permanent damage. And so as the counties are on the ground right now responding to this public health crisis, to ensure that it doesn't become a long-term community crisis, we need the state to do its part to continue to provide, um, to provide that strong safety net, while at the same time not applying additional pressure on businesses and Oregonians that they really uh, can't afford right now uh, to continue to pay costs like it's business as usual. So we're going to have to make some hard choices at the state level, but I believe that we can do that in a bipartisan fashion. Um, right now, the state is struggling to make sure that all of those unemployment benefit checks uh, go out to people who are so desperately in need right now. And that is an issue that I know at hiring, when you talk about hiring contact tracers, at the employment department, they had to ramp up. I, I believe they've hired about 400 individuals within that agency in an extraordinarily fast amount of time. I mean, that is a feat, right, at a government level to achieve that. Um, but it, we still face tens of thousands of people who have yet to be able to work through that process because we have an antiquated system. And so there's no getting around it in this time. We have some technology issues that are really an impediment to providing full service there. But the employment department is working as fast as they can to get out the PUA benefits as well as the more traditional unemployment benefits. And, um, and they are making great strides and great progress. We recognize, though, that there are still people that are hurting. There are still families that need those funds. And there are certainly still independent contractors and um, and, uh, and uh, solo practitioners out there who, who need access to those funds too. And so we continue to support the work of that agency and provide whatever resources they need to make sure that they can meet that need. Um, at a, as we move forward though, we continue to talk with the governor about a potential special session. And she had indicated originally that that would be a discussion after we had the May forecast. And we now have the May forecast and she is asking agencies to take a look at more substantial across the board cuts, which in the final year of our budget cycle, being about 15%. 15% just across the board is not a good approach. When what you wanna do is preserve the safety net. And so we're hopeful that we can work with the governor and that she will make the decision to call us into a special session if we have a bipartisan agreement on how to move forward with rebalancing the budget. And, um, and as, we, as we do that work, I, I think that uh, we will have to keep in mind this whole idea that it's, our, that it's our job to ensure that we do everything we can to avoid permanent damage to this economy and that we can continue to support cash flow at a business level and supports for families who are in between jobs right now as those businesses take a new shape 
in, in what is probably gonna be a very different economic mix moving forward. Um, so I think that that for me was the end of my prepared comments. And again, apologies for my uh, internet issues. I do love rural Clackamas County, but it does have some downside. <laughs> I can understand that. Representative Drayson, I'm not sure that all of our um, listeners would understand why it would be important or why it'd be necessary for the legislature to come back in a special session to make those financial decisions. It's a process question. Could you briefly explain that so they'd understand why? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that the best way to describe it is that budgets express priorities. And the legislature is the only, the only entity in state government that can help us fully express those priorities. The governor, the executive, uh, they, she can administer the budgets that the legislature has passed. And in a crisis, in a downturn, she can implement cuts that are even across all budgets. If we wanna be surgical, if we wanna be careful, if we wanna protect the safety net, the only, the only branch of government that can do that is the legislature. If the governor does not call us in, we will not be able to carefully respond to the immediate needs for Oregonians by carefully cutting budgets rather than just cutting everything in the same amount. So are you saying that she doesn't have authority to cut one department by 10 and another department by two? It needs to be in equal all the way across. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the governor's the the governor uh, cannot cannot discriminate among agencies for who takes a greater or a smaller cut. She can't protect anyone and uh, and she's and she certainly uh, can't cut anyone more deeply than anyone else. Right. So she has to abide by the direction of the legislature for how they um, how they originally passed the close of session budget. Um, she can she can change it at the same percentage across the board. The other thing she can't do, not to get too in the weeds here, she cannot take a measured approach to that. If the if the forecast that we received demands a 15% across the board cut, if she was to act at all, she would have to make that full cut. She can't say, I'm going to make an initial cut of 2% across the board and then call the legislature in, in six months. That is not within her. She acts, she has to act to rebalance the budget within whatever the amount of the shortfall is. Otherwise, she needs to she needs to call the legislature in. She doesn't have additional flexibility. That's just the separation of powers makes that really clear. So what you're saying is her hands are tied, whether she wants to, wants them tied or not. And um, so that that's a, a great answer to that process question. I appreciate that. And it, it helps remind me of the, the unfortunate part of being the boss and the fortunate part. You, you still need to work with your partners on, on everything and the legislative branch is one of those partners in that. So thank you very much for um, joining us today, Representative Drazen, I appreciate that so much. We're now um, to our fourth and final speaker of the day, Mayor Shane Bemis, he doesn't need an introduction but I'm going to give him one anyway as a brief reminder. And he wrote this for me to read. No, I did not. He did not do that. At the age of 34, Mayor Bemis was the youngest serving mayor in Gresham's history. And now in his fourth term, Mayor Bemis remains focused on progress in economic development, our community safety and livability. And he's focused on making Gresham a thriving environment for children and families. Mayor Bemis has emerged as a respected leader in both the local and national stage. Locally, is the founding member, member of the current and the current chairman of the Metropolitan Mayors Consortium. It's a group comprised of all 25 Portland Metropolitan Region's mayors. The Metropolitan Mayors Consortium advocates on behalf of the local governments in their interests, both regionally and at the state legislature. I want to give you a special shout out, Mayor Bemis, and to the council and your staff as well for the generous and important grants that were given to so many of our small businesses to help them weather this COVID storm. It was, um, we're obviously in a very unusual circumstance. You didn't have it in your budget. Gee, if a storm hits, this is what we're going to do. So I appreciate all the efforts that you've made. And I know all the businesses that received those 
um, unexpected grants appreciated as well. But just to conclude, Mayor Bemis's business background helps our community more fully understand that public and private partnerships are critical. Neither are healthy without the other. So that being said, Mayor Bemis, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Lynn, and uh, thank you to everybody that's on the call. I appreciate everybody taking the time, particularly appreciate uh, the county chair and Dr. Blind uh, affording themselves to our business community. I think it's good uh, that I would communicate directly uh, with them. Um, as you know, we've had a couple of these Zoom calls, Lynn, and sort of talked at sort of a high level of some of the things that we've done at the city, which was the biggest thing was to get out those business grants right away. Um, we knew that you know, liquidity was what our business community needed and in quick fashion and there was nobody that was going to help them uh, as expeditiously as we could. So we started doing the restaurant grants uh, because restaurants were the first industry that were closed. We did those and we opened it up to phase two, which uh, was to all Gresham small businesses. And in total, I think we had just about close to a million dollars uh, out the door into local Gresham uh, businesses, which I think probably made well, I know it made the difference uh, for, for a bunch of those small businesses. I was thinking as um, I'm sitting here in my empty restaurant, which has been closed since obviously the 16th of March, and I'm looking out at the intersection here of downtown. And, and when we talk about these businesses, I think it's, I can't talk about them without knowing them by name, right? Like this isn't just these obscure people. This is, this is Judy and Cody and Mike and Ron and, to Miko and all of these people that have been building this life um, of a small business and, and, and getting better at their entrepreneurship every single day. And here we are in sort of a surreal setting where there's not even a car to be seen, and, which is good, right? Good that we're doing what we need to do in terms of the health piece, but the economic piece is substantial as everybody knows. And the quicker that we can get open in a safe manner, um, the less damage, of course, that is going to happen to these small businesses. But the reality is there's a bunch of these people on this street that I can look at that are coming back. Uh, they just are. And that has real impact um, not only in those uh, individual families, but it has impact in our community because every one of those businesses has contributed to this community uh, in a positive way. And so I think we all want the same thing, which was to, which, which is to get open safely uh, but I will say that um, the coordination, as Chair Corey mentioned, with Clackamas uh, and Washington County, I think is important. And I think it's important that we somehow figure out how to do that as a region, um, because Clackamas and Washington County is open and Multnomah not. From my mayor perspective, says to me that it means like, there's there's issues with that. There's issues. We're seeing issues with domestic violence right now. Uh, we're seeing issues uh, in terms of no. Uh, limited to child abuse that is being reported. We know that there are issues there. And as this goes on, every day that goes on, more issues come into the police department in terms of people's ability to navigate through these challenging times. When you, you know, are losing your business, your job, and nothing seems to ever look as normal again, things get really uncertain. And the, and the, and the agency that picks that up is the local police department. And so we're trying to figure out in terms of, you know, you know, keeping the community together, which is what we've been, you know, focused solely on to try and provide ways for the community to stay together in all of this. But the reality is, um, as everybody knows, we've got to figure out how to get our economic vitality open and back in a safe and meaningful way. And I am uh, will continue to work with Chair Kapori, uh, the Representative Drazen at the state, every representative we can get to, whoever, we're ready to work with everybody, obviously. So. Um, we need to be open and get moving. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to ask you a date question now. I've asked uh, two of the other speakers. When is clam chowder going to become available at the Chelly's on Fridays again? I'm missing my chowder. Do you have a date? Well, you know, I have a date. And then Madam Chair has a date, so my date doesn't matter. Um, but again, I, again, I think I think we can do this in a safe manner. I think that the contract, tra the contact tracing, getting that ramped up, obviously, is a big 
big part of it, but I, I would hate to be in a position where I'm sitting in my empty restaurant and Christmas is open and Washington is open and our businesses are not. And I think that, because I just think that that, from a lot of different perspectives, that's just not a good thing. So to the extent that we can figure out how to ramp all that up, which I, I have confidence in Chair Kapoor and her ability to do that, um, I think, you know, we can get coordinated and open all, hopefully, hopefully all at the same time. Mayor, I, I would agree with that. Um, when the announcement came that the other, it, it was everybody's assumption that all three counties were going to be working together and they'd all drop their applications at the same date. And, you know, we're in this, the phrase, we're in this together and all that. And that's, it's not, it doesn't appear that's going to happen exactly. Although Chair Capri has given us confidence that it's not going to be a long time wait. But it was another thing that a lot of our businesses always had to have something to worry about. It's hard enough that they're worried about their employees and rent, and now they're worried about competition in another county. So it's like another, what else? And, you know, so well, I've got my business, and I'm right next door to Clackamas County, and now but the business, the customers are going to drive by mine and go three blocks into a different county. And so it's just one more thing as an example. And I'm I'm not being critical. I'm just being realistic that that's another worry for a lot of the a lot of folks. Um, that own businesses that now have something new to think about. We also have a lot. We've had, we've seen a lot of customers in the last three or four days that have come into the restaurant demanding that they be seated in a table and demanding that they be able to have their friends and we serve them in the ta in the table in the restaurant. And again, that all goes to people's into the people's mental, you know, ability through this crisis. It's like. We are weaning and weaning and weaning to a point where, you know, yeah, more than a little concerned about some of the mental health stuff that's going on. So, to the extent that we can all be coordinated, message together. One thing that is um, has been very comforting to me, and it's because I've known both of you for a very long time. The fact that our mayor and it's for I'm I'm actually talking to everybody that's in the that's participating right now. Our mayor and Chair Kapori have a strong relationship. They don't agree on everything. I, I'm not going to uh, promise that or make you think that. Did you see how she shook her head so quickly? What? See that? But, but the point is that they have, they have such a good relationship that they can disagree on things and still help each other. And that's, that's a testament to how Chair Kapori has listened to our business community and has tried very hard to include our business community here because of the relationship that she has with you, Mayor, and you sitting at the table wanting to help however you can, the county, on the county level. Not all communities have that that kind of relationship. And I, I just want to compliment you on that um, so much, on both of you, for being able to be willing to, to talk across the aisle and in your different elected positions and do the best for the community. So that being said, I, I'm going to wrap up by, um, unless any of you, any of the speakers have anything else that you want to say, you know, raise your hand and Dr. Vines, did you think of anything else? Chair Kapoor, you have something? Go ahead. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say thank you again, um, Lynn, to you for inviting me to be on today. Thank you for all your members and their patience. Um, and I just, I know sometimes we get really bogged down in, in data and numbers and it sounds like we're not that it's coming from a place of you know science and data instead of coming from a, a place of, of heartfelt and every decision that we make is 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 a challenging one because we are through a public health lens really trying to weigh the different forces at play here it's not just we're only doing it this way all the time we're really weighing the impacts and i think the mayor just talked about the mental health impacts the behavioral which are real and we see those every day in the work that we do at the county so um, I just want, want you all to know that we appreciate the work that you're doing. We appreciate um, your patience in this, and we will get through this. We will get through this together. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Does anybody else have a comment they'd like to make? Final comment? Raise your hand. Could the so Chair make one exception to open up one barber shop in downtown Washington? <laughs> just for a day. I think we would all agree with that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, but there would be a long line. It wouldn't be just for you, Mayor. I'm sorry. So thank you all so much for being here. And it, there's a common thread through this, and that is the physical health. We are dealing with the physical health, and all everything that we that all the decisions that you're making 
is based on the physical health. But if equal, and in some cases more important, is the mental health, as the mayor brought up, and the mental health, we may not know for months or years what is going on in our children's lives right now as they are hearing the messaging and watching posts that they love pass away, thinking, you know, thinking things. So there's a mental health issue. Losing a business, that's a mental health issue. Um, so there's the physical health that we're dealing with, the mental health that we are dealing with now and may deal with for many years. And then there's the business health. And none of our speakers today have questioned the importance of our business health. Those of us that own a business have a higher priority of business health because that's what we live. And that's equally important. But I would personally think that the, that business health is critical for that full circle. A business health helps with the mental health, helps with the physical health all the way around. So that's why I asked you the question about dates. It's to give us hope, the business hope of what can what can happen. So the business owners are action group, are action um, activists. I mean, they're ready to act. They're ready to do. They want to help find contact tracers. They want to help you come up with the funds. That's that's their mental that's their mental state. So anything that we could do that would be helpful to you, we will because it would be helpful to us as business owners and our nonprofits benefit, et cetera. So that being said, again, I want to thank you all. Thank you, Jennifer, um, Dr. Vines, for being here today. Chair Kafori, thank you so much for taking the time. I will mention that I I emailed her and I got an email back in like five minutes and I thought it'd be five days. So I want to thank you very much for that. I thought you would be so busy that you would have a hard time finding room for us. So I appreciate the, the quick response. Mayor Bemis, thank you very much for coming again. You've done this multiple times. I appreciate that. And Representative Drazen, um, I, again, I want to thank you for your perspective on, on everything and even though Gresham is not part of your community for you being willing to join us today, I appreciate your time. So if any of you have questions that you want to ask and further, please go ahead and put them in the chat. We'll leave the, the box open until four o'clock. And I promise I will pass those questions on to our amazing speakers that we had today. So thank you very much. Let's get us county open. Thank you.